Motivational speaker and author Spencer Johnson wrote a book entitled, Who Moved My Cheese? How many people remember that book? Who moved, not a lot of readers, I guess, okay. <laughs> Who Moved My Cheese? It became a monster hit, reaching number one bestseller status on various lists, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, USA Today, big, big book. I remember buying it back then. The book was uh, essentially a modern parable about change and how different people react in a positive or negative way in order to accommodate change in their lives. Now the idea of cheese and who moves it was the author's clever way of expressing the idea that what we desire in life, you know the cheese, what we desire in life and how we obtain it is constantly changing and unless we adapt we will die. Now in a section called The Handwriting on the Wall, Dr. Johnson summarizes the seven key ideas in the book concerning change. The first key idea is the bottom line reality in life that all must accept. Everybody needs to accept this basic reality of life and that is uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what it is in a minute. The first idea is um, uh, 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 that everybody needs to accept this first idea. And then the other six key ideas are various ways that people can sex, uh, successfully deal with the first idea. I'm a little confused here. Let me, let me give you idea number one and you'll see where I'm going. Key idea number one. Key idea number one is the change happens. That's the base. Change happens. Or as the author puts it, they keep moving my cheese around. This is reality number one. The fact that the source of your happiness, the basis or the object of your contentment is constantly changing. If you understand and accept this, then you have taken the first and most important step in dealing with change. Now, as I tried to explain in the preamble, once you have grasped key idea number one, you know, change happens, you can now use the other six key ideas in your own personal experience with change. So key idea number two, anticipate change. Anticipate change. Be ready for the cheese to move. Don't fret, don't worry or whine. Just be ready for it to happen because it always happens. There's always change. Key idea number three, monitor change. Smell the cheese from time to time to see if it's still good. Sometimes change is needed and we just don't realize it. We're wondering, what's going on? What's happening? Why can't this happen? And all of a sudden we realize, oh, I, I need to change this. Key idea number four, Adapt to change quickly. The sooner you let go the old cheese, the sooner you get the new cheese. Don't waste all your energy and resources and goodwill fighting change. Get into it or get left behind. Idea number five, change with change. Go where the cheese is. Don't just acknowledge that there is a change. You must also change yourself if you want to succeed. Key idea number six, enjoy the change, savor the cheese. Change can be good, so enjoy the experience as much as you can. And then key idea number seven, repeat change. Hey, they moved the cheese again. Realize that the change experience is constant in life and you'll have to go through it many times because that's what life is about. People spend, many people spend the greatest part of their energy and ability resisting inevitable change that happens in everybody's life. And what uh, the author here was trying to get across was instead of spending all your time and energy resisting change, in other words, resisting change is your default position, how about considering change? from time to time, cooperating with it, and you know, the keys that it gives here. So this is the essence of this little book 
that has, believe it or not, less than 100 pages and lots of pictures uh, and 12 point type. And at that time, I remember, it was selling for $20. <laughs> That was a lot of cheese for Dr. Johnson, I want to tell you that. 20 bucks for the little book. And it was written, you know, it was a general idea, just caught on, mainly aimed at, you know, at businesses and business people in the workforce, things like that. Well, our life is more than cheese, right? If our lives were lived only here on this earth and we had to deal with the ever shifting reality of this world with only our own wisdom or maybe the wisdom of Dr. Johnson here, this little book would be very helpful. Actually, it is helpful in the sense that it does remind us that in life things do change and we constantly have to adapt in order to deal successfully with this reality. One very important thing that the book fails to mention, however, is that not all things change. Not everything changes. As a matter of fact, in this changing world, there are several unchanging realities. And that's really what I want to focus on tonight. The first reality about things that don't change is that God does not change. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The God of creation has always existed, even before this changing world existed. He existed. Not only has God always existed, but He has always been the same, without change. A couple of scriptures. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of, ja uh, of Jacob, are not consumed. Malachi 3, uh, 6. And then James uh, says the following concerning this matter. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. What does he say about? With whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, no change. You always know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with the Lord. This eternal changeless being created a changing world and in doing so made possible the expression of his own immut uh, immutability. We know, we understand, we appreciate his unchanging nature because we live in a changing world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to discern this primary quality that he has. That God is changeless is seen as we glimpse his eternal nature through the looking glass of this passing world. Another changeless reality, the word of God never changes. Isaiah said it so eloquently when he wrote in the power of the spirit, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40 verse eight. This unchanging feature of God's word is seen in various contexts. For example, the premise of God's word does not change. You know, the story that the word tells is relevant to every generation from creation to the consummation of the ages. The content of scriptures is the divine context for our lives and our history and our future. In other words, the word tells every generation its essential life story without change. People who heard the gospel in the 17th century and in the 11th century and in the 9th century and in the 1st century were being addressed with a timeless message that didn't change. God's word fit perfectly their life and circumstances, whether they were Gentiles living in Thessalonica or Jews living in Jerusalem. And 21 centuries later, Americans living in Oklahoma City, God's word 
It never changes and it has the ability to explain man's condition in every context, in any time, until the end of the world. Another unchanging feature of God's word is the fact that the power of God's word, it doesn't change either. The word never loses its power to establish moral norms. We're reading epistles, for example, that teach us how we should conduct ourselves you know, in the church and as Christians and, and what is the right way to act and what is the wrong way to act and so on and so forth. We're reading that today. It has the power to form our character and to direct our lives. And yet people a thousand years ago were reading the exact same words that had exactly the same powerful effect on their lives. What book, what notes, what author can claim the same other than the Lord who has given us His, His word? The content of the scriptures is the divine context, as I said, for our lives. The word tells every generation its life story and tells every generation what the future will be for them according to God's unchanging word. It has the power to do this in every, every generation. Um, um, the words of men come and go. The words of men rise and fall in their ability to move people and to move nations. How many people remember Mao Zedong? You remember Mao Zedong, the leader of China, the revolution in China, brought the communist ideology to China. How many people remember Mao Zedong's little red book? Every citizen had to have a little red book. It was actually a little red book. One of the members of the church in Montreal, who was from China, brought me one and, and gave it to me to, that I could see. It was in Chinese, obviously I couldn't read it, but he was telling me that everybody carried one of these books with them and what it included were the sayings of Mao. How one should conduct themselves, what life was about, so everybody had that book. Notice I said, how many people have heard of you know, Mao Zedong, not everybody raised their hand. And then I asked, how many people have heard of you know, Mao Zedong, Little Red Book? And even less people raised their hand. And Mao, he, it's not like he was alive 500 years ago, it's just in the 20th century. And yet we've many have forgotten his name, don't know who he is, much less the little, you know, the little red book. Where is he today? He's gone. Where's his little red book? It's a souvenir. It doesn't guide anybody's life anymore. But God's word has never lost a fraction of its power to do what it claims to do, and that is to regenerate man's everlasting soul. So the word has not changed in its premise it hasn't changed in its power, and neither has it changed its everlasting promise. The promise of God's word never changes. You know, Adam and Eve believed the promise contained in God's word to them, and they lived to hope beyond mankind's greatest sin. Noah believed the promise contained in God's word and survived the global flood. Abraham believed the promise contained in God's word and had a son at the age of 100. The Jews believed and they eventually lived in the land of milk and honey. The apostles believed and saw a risen Lord. The world believes and receives unconditional forgiveness and the indwelling of God's spirit. The word does not change in its promise that those who believe it will receive the blessings that it offers. And so God's word is unchanging in its premise, its power, and its promise. People change, society changes, 
Ideas change, but God's word never changes. Isn't that wonderful to note, to understand, to grasp? When you're, when you're reading God's word, you're reading something that just will not change. The beauty of that is that when you learn something in God's word, when you receive it, believe it, what you have just learned will not change. When I grew up as a Catholic boy in the Catholic church, uh, you know, we would get letter, uh, uh, encyclicals, the Pope would write encyclicals and then it would filter down to the local congregation and they would tell us you know, what's happening and what's not happening. And I remember uh, one of my aunts, her favorite saint was Saint Philomena. That was her saint, boy. She was saint, it's like a, you still having your own team. You know? She had Saint Philomena, that was her saint. There was even a church, Saint Philomena Church she used to go to. And uh, she would buy a calendar, Saint Philomena's calendar. She was a saint and her, 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 her day, you know, I forget what, when it was, but you know, her, her, her day where you honored her sometime in May or something, Saint Philomena, she had holy pictures, Saint Philomena, the whole thing. Well then one day, one day, we got the news that Saint Philomena was not a saint anymore. They had to make room for new saints, you know, and Saint Philomena, she was out. And the Saint Philomena Church was now Saint John's Church or something. And I remember my aunt was so upset. How can they do that? You know, my whole life I've been praying to Saint Philomena. She's gone, she's out. How did she, how could she deal with a change like that? Why did it change like that? It changed like that because <laughs> it was a man-made thing. Human beings made that up. And human beings changed it. Isn't it wonderful when you read just the Bible and believe what's in the Bible, what you have learned as true remains true today, tomorrow, forever, what you know is true is true? How do you think the apostles and the early martyrs were able to go to their deaths, unwilling to change what they believed and confessed in order to save their own lives? Can't we understand the motivation that they had? You know, go ahead, beat me, kill me even. How can I deny what I know is true? And you killing me is not going to make it untrue. That's the, that's the power of God's word. To give us power. Finally, in our review of the short review of the unchanging, we need to realize that, of course, right? Jesus Christ, <laughs> He doesn't change either. You read books that were written 100 years ago, 300 years ago, about Jesus. You know, devotional literature written about Jesus hundreds of years ago and you can relate immediately to what he's talking He's talking about somebody that you know. You're reading it and you're saying, that's exactly how Jesus is. Yes, I understand that about Jesus. I've also discovered that about him. Wait a minute, you, you're 300 years apart talking about the same person. How does that work? Jesus doesn't change. In speaking of his timelessness, and the timeless nature that he has. The Hebrew writer says of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Not only is Christ unchanging, he is also eternal and omnipresent. For this reason, he was the reason and force for creation, Colossians 1.16. He was with the Jews to sustain them in the desert. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. He died on the cross, John 19. He appeared to the apostles after His resurrection, Acts 1, 3, and 4. He is with all Christians through the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 
and 38. He will be with all Christians and judge sinners and disbelievers and disobedient at the end of the world, Matthew 25 and 2 Thessalonians 4. He will rule at the right hand of God for all eternity, Matthew 19, 28, 2 Timothy 2, 12. How can one person do all these things? How can one person be at all these things? How can the same person exist in all of these different dimensions? In the past physical world, in the future spiritual world, how can the same person do that? He is unchanging, why? Because he is eternal, that's why. And so Jesus does not change in person, in position, or in power. As I said, societies change, the creation changes, we change, but He never changes. You know when we say that He's the anchor of our souls, He's always at the same place, isn't He? You know many times I say to you in classes, I remind you, and encourage you to listen to the voice inside your head or your heart that speaks to you. And I encourage you always, ask yourself, who's talking to you? If the one inside is criticizing you and telling you that you're unworthy and no good, ask yourself, is that Jesus talking to you? If the voice inside says, come, come you who are burdened and heavy laden, come, I will give you rest. That's not the devil talking. And he speaks to all of us in the same way. People say to me, yeah, I had that experience. I know exactly what you're saying, why? because the same Lord that speaks to me through His word and through His spirit speaks to you. And in His wisdom has given us concrete word in our language so we can make sure that it is He who is talking to us through His word. He's easy to find. He's easy to recognize in every generation, in every situation, because He is always the same, the same, the same Lord, the same Christ, the same person. So in our lives as citizens of this world, the cheese does get moved, and we do have to accommodate ourselves to never-ending change until we die. But in our lives as citizens of the kingdom of God, however, we can take comfort in the fact that there is a constant, a permanence, a stable set of realities because the source of our happiness and peace is always the same. Nobody is going to move it. And here's why we can have confidence in this. Confidence in what I call our immovable cheese. That's where the title comes from. We have confidence because, as I mentioned, God never changes. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, is the same God of the 21st century. We can depend on Him. Now that cuts both ways. You know that God you read in the Old Testament who says, if you disobey me, you know, the earth will swallow you up and, and eat you, you know, and, and you will die. That's the same God that we're praying to. The God that is offended because someone offers uh, worship to Him in, a, in, a, in an improper manner and they, they die instantly. Yeah, that's the same God that we have today. The God who spoke to his people with fire and noise and you know, uh, the earth trembling. That's the same God that we pray to today. It's not like, hey, you know God, he's mellowed out, the 20th century, come on, you know, we got to let things slide. 
It's okay, me and God are buddies. He doesn't care. He doesn't care how I dress. He doesn't care what I say. You know, we're, we're good. We're tight. You know, no, no, no. No, he's a holy God. A holy God. The God they were afraid to even go forward. They said to Moses, you talk to him. Don't let him come near us. Yeah, that God, that's our God. Yes, we can depend on Him, and yes, He never changes, but let's make sure we understand exactly who He is. A holy God demanding that we be a holy people in our speech, in our conduct, in our dress, in our attention. Yeah, that God. We have confidence because God's word never changes. Let me go back one here, there we go. God's word never changes, yes. The story it tells remains the same. The power it has never wavers. The promises it makes are ever sure. We can depend on it, but we also have to remember to learn it, preach it as it is, and make sure that we pass it on to the next generation complete without changing, without eliminating or adding. That's our responsibility. And of course, God's Christ never changes. He is and will forever be the Son of God and Savior of our souls. We can depend on the Lord. The same Lord that the martyrs in the first century gave up their lives in order to confess, we need to be ready to give up our lives. In the same way, He is worthy for us to give up our lives in order to maintain our good confession of faith. We haven't been asked to do this in a dramatic way, of course, but we could, we could. And so after hearing about these two realities, the two realities being one, uh, things in the world change constantly. And two, things in the kingdom of God always remain the same. After reviewing these two realities, what conclusions should we come to? What should these things mean for us? Well, knowing these two things means that, first of all, we must learn to separate these two. You see, just because your world changes from time to time doesn't mean that God is changing, or His power has diminished, or His promises are no longer available. Don't confuse the changing world with the unchanging God. You know, some people think that because their lives have changed for the worse, that God has somehow lost His power or backed out of His promises. They don't realize that a change in life, especially a difficult one, is usually a call for us to sustain an unchanging faith. How else does God test our faith? With gifts, with presents, with good times? No. No, He examines our faith through difficult changes. A change of health, a change of economic level, a change of ability, a change in family. Through our changes, God is whispering to us, do you still believe that I am here? Do you still believe that I am with you? Do you still believe that I can deliver you? As a matter of fact, turmoil caused by change is best dealt with an unshakable faith in what is truly constant, truly steady and unmovable. Perhaps in the context of this lesson, we could say that one way God tests our faith is to move our cheese around from time to time. Finally, knowing these realities about the nature of the world and the kingdom should mean that we must be ready and are ready for the final change. All of our changes are simply conditioning us to realize, accept, and prepare for the final change, and that is, of course, death itself. 
It's amazing that everything in the physical world points to this sobering reality, but so many people refuse to deal with it, let alone prepare for it. And when I say prepare, I don't mean buying a burial plot and planning your funeral and getting a will ready. I mean, of course, do that. But that's simply a plan for the disposal of your body, not a preparation for death. People think, oh, I'm ready for death. You know, I got the plot, I got the headstone, I got the, you know, a, a power of attorney, a, you know, a health proxy. You're, you're not ready for death. You're, you're just ready for you know, burial, disposal, because that's all those things do. They help in the disposal. Preparing, preparing for death requires us to decide where we will live after we die. That's preparal for death. Will we live with uh, 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 and commune with God in His eternal spiritual kingdom of life? Is, is that where we plan on living after we die? Or will we live in darkness, plagued by regret and tortured with the absence of the Spirit eternally? Regardless of where your earthly cheese slash happiness is or was or will be. Regardless of how well you've learned to adapt to the changes in this world, all of us need to take comfort in the fact that the unchanging God makes an unchanging promise to you in His unchanging word guaranteed by His unchanging Son. And this is that you are to believe in Christ, confess His name, repent of your sins, and are baptized today, you too can become unchanging in life, unchanging in spirit, in time, in joy, in love, in Christ, all unchanging. And the way to prepare for that is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. We could be transported back you know, to the first century. We would not understand the language. We would not understand the social customs. The food would be very, very strange for us and what we would drink. We would be completely lost. I mean, we'd recognize human beings, but other than that, we, we wouldn't be able to communicate. You know, we, we would be completely lost, except if we were at church. <laughs> If we were at a church service 2,000 years ago, we might not understand the language, but we would know exactly what was going on. And if someone came forward after the teacher or preacher had spoken what we thought was the gospel, we would know exactly what was going on as they went to the baptismal font or the, 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 the river or whatever. We'd know exactly what's going on. We wouldn't understand the words, but we'd know exactly what, what was happening. Why? Because the way to prepare for death 2,000 years ago has remained the same for 2,000 years. We prepare for death in exactly the same way. We bury the old body of sin in the waters of baptism, we resurrect a new spirit, a new life, a regenerated soul, ready now for death, ready now to live in an unchanging place because we finally have become unchanging. And so if you desire to live in this future unchanging place and have not yet prepared for that in the way that I have described to you, even tonight, this humble and small setting of an evening service, if the Lord is calling you to do what Christians or believers have done for thousands of years, if this is the night you are to respond, then we encourage you to do that now as we stand and as Mike leads us in our song of encouragement.